right? I mean, I mean, you not, would think that. I would, yeah. But he's saying let others weigh what was said. In other words, let them, like you said, dialogue about it and put it in context and try to understand what's really meant here. So there is a sense of responsibility to contribute as well as a sense of responsibility to be contributed to. Good point. In the, in this whole in this whole context. Why don't we go to uh, one of the last points that we're going to be talking about is remember the gifts of tongues were only given under certain conditions and they were only passed on by the apostles' words or actions. I think that's an important point to end with. And we we touched on that earlier in your right. It's, it's it's important to come back around to it because there's this incredibly long dialogue that the apostle puts in place to explain the proper use of these tongues. Now remember, it's the 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 ironic thing almost is that the apostle Paul would have been the one to give them the gift. <laughs> Good point. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's the one who started the Corinthian church. You're right. So he would have been the one to give them this gift. Then he goes off onto other ministry, and he finds out that they are just they're, they're just blowing it. They're, they're just, misusing right, the gifts because they don't know how. It's not that they can't use it correctly. It's that they don't know how. They're just not mature enough. So he patiently writes to them, and you know, and it's interesting. He comes down hard, but not without a dramatic amount of reasoning. Mm-hmm. To help them get it straight, but but you're right. The the gifts these gifts are only passed on, as far as I can tell, by the apostles' words or actions. And that, again, let's look at those those three scriptures. Read them earlier, but let's read them again. Acts two, three, and four. Divided tongues as a fire appearing um, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And that is referring to the apostles being given that gift. And and again, apostleship was a gift itself. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that that that's one thing. So the apostles were given this miraculous gift, and it was very obvious what it was being used for because the context tells you everybody heard the gospel in their own language. Acts ten forty four through forty six. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God, then answered Peter. Okay, so this was at the conversion of Cornelius, and there was a lot of of, uh, providential overruling going on. Remember the visitation of the angel to Cornelius, Mm -hmm. and the angel tells Cornelius to send for Peter, tells him where he is. That's right. And as Peter, as they're going to get him, Cornelius assembles all of these other individuals who he had talked to, to about the goodness of God because he was a very devout man. And the Apostle Peter arrives and they have a conversation and the Apostle Peter is speaking and all of a sudden you have the Holy Spirit being granted to these individuals. And one of the evidences of that is their ability to speak in foreign languages. And remember, we were talking about different lands, different people. There was a lot of different dialects and languages in play. That's right. And so you saw that they were able to communicate with the, the, the Jews that had come to, to with Peter to see them. So y- you see that and you say, wow, this is an evidence of the Holy Spirit. But it was used in the proper context to witness to the, to, to the glory of God. And it wasn't to say, oh, look at me. That's right. And then the next one. Acts 19, verse 6, when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Okay, and that was in the, um, I forget which con- what the context was of that one. Uh, I'm drawing a blank, but let me go back. Oh, this was, oh, okay, in Corinth. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I forgot about that because uh, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road to the interior, right? Oh, at Ephesus, I'm sorry. And so he goes from Corinth to Ephesus, and he is going from place to place proclaiming the gospel. And he is there, and he lays hands on those individuals, and the Holy Spirit comes to them. And an evidence of that is the speaking in tongues and the prophecy. And isn't that interesting that the two of them are right there? Yes. And so the speaking in tongues was being used for the right reason. Okay, it was put in context. And, and Fred, what do we have for time, like two minutes or something? Uh, yeah, about two, three minutes. Okay. There. So, Jonathan, as, let, let, let's wrap this up. We live in a day where, obviously, we are 2,000 years away from the writing of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And in that period of time, there are obviously 
many, many, many different understandings and interpretations of what the gospel really means. Right. And that's why you have denominations of Christianity. That's why you have non-denominational Christianity. And within denominations, you have disagreements on all kinds of things. Uh, and th- th- that's a challenge. There's no question about it. This is one of those areas where there's a, a, a great divide. Now, obviously, from our perspective, we're very much on one side of this issue and yes. not the other. Yes. There's not a lot of wiggle room as far as I can tell <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> from this perspective. Why? Why is that? And I think the answer is that when you understand what the gifts of the Spirit were given for, and that really was, and you had mentioned it earlier, I think Julius actually had mentioned it uh, or, or in the first hour, the gifts of the Spirit were given to give the followers of Christ a, a unifying jumpstart effect to, to move the gospel forward, to mm-hmm. establish it, to give it something to stand on. Right. Okay? And you had, once the gospel was established... And once the apostles were off the scene, you had a very clear uh, geography of the gospel. That's right. Okay? The, the last apostle to go off of the scene would have been the apostle John, probably about A.D. 90-something. That's because that's when he wrote the Revelation. That's right. 90, I forget what year, 90-something. But anyway, so you have a period of time of about 55 or 60 years, let's say where you have these gifts working because you have the apostles there um, as as the, the pillars of the church. Once the apostles went to sleep, what you have is their writings. And what did their writings do? Their writings, along with the gift of the, the Holy Spirit, which is to help us to understand them, put Christianity in a place where it could develop as it was meant to. And that is person to person, growing and developing, learning a life of sacrifice and that selfless love that was mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13. Right. So you have the gifts being given for a very specific reason. But once the reason is over, guess what? It's over. The chapter ends. You're on to a new chapter, and you have different things happening. Last scripture, we've read it a few times, but one more time. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. And again, that is talking about the gift of prophecy, the gift of speaking in tongues, the gift of miraculous knowledge. All of these things the apostle is saying will come to an end. Why? Because they won't be needed anymore. Why? Well, because the gospel is a calling out, remember, to a life of sacrifice, which is not uh, appealing to everybody. No, no everybody, everybody really doesn't like that. You know, we like the gospel of of, uh, of abundance, but we don't necessarily like the gospel of sacrifice. Now, there's a, an abundant ability to live within the context of sacrifice. The Corinthians didn't get it. They needed to be taught it. When we look at the gift of speaking in tongues, it had a place, and its place is gone. But don't worry, because what replaces it is that never-ending selfless love that is there to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to build each other up, not ourselves. Folks, we hope you've enjoyed being with us this morning as we talked about what is somewhat of a difficult subject, and we took uh, what is somewhat of a difficult hard line on it, but that's what the Apostle Paul said. So for Jonathan and Rick, this is Christian Questions. We'll be back next week, but until then, should Christians be speaking in tongues? Uh, Not so much. Think about it. 